Hey church, how you doing today? Thanks for being here this morning. I love that you're here and ready to pour into God's word together. We are gonna be in Genesis chapter 32 and also in Genesis chapter 33 together. So if you wanna go there and open it up. In fact, if you, if you do have a, a physical Bible with you and you're a note taker in your Bible, this will be a great morning because there'll be a couple uh, references you might circle or write down beside this passage. So Genesis 32 and 33, that's at the very beginning of the Bible. And if you don't have a Bible with you, don't even worry about it. It'll be on the screen behind me. And if you're watching online, it'll be at the bottom of the screen. Before we jump in though to God's word, two announcements, and you heard about both of these earlier. Let me just remind you, the first is special needs VBS starts this week. It is going to be awesome. Last year was so great and we are really looking forward to it. In fact, there may be some of those guests who have come to join us for worship today. And if you're here, we're really thankful you honor us by being here. What I want to ask you all to do, Highlanders, is to leave here as service ends and go by the Go Center, which is just out there to the left. And every single one of those participants, their name is on the top of a card out there. And I want you to go out there, pick somebody and sign their card and just say, hey, Jake, I am praying for you this week that you have an awesome time and that you get to know Jesus better and sign your name. And then I want you to pray for Jake or whoever it is the rest of this week if you'd be willing to do that. And so when they show up tomorrow, they're gonna get a card that's covered in signatures and notes from Highlanders from people saying, hey, we are praying for you this week. Okay, so please do that. And then secondly, this weekend, Friday and Saturday, we've got our marriage retreat happening here at Highland that our marriage ministry has put together. It is going to be incredible. Lindsay and I are gonna be there. There's childcare available. All you gotta do is sign up. We would love for you to come and be part of that. And uh, I hope that you'll just, come and be blessed by that. And so some of you, you know, maybe you've been married a while, you, you know, you're thinking to yourself, at this point, my marriage is what it is. Okay. You know, like there's no changing things or something. I don't know that, you know, maybe you wrote the book on marriage. You don't need to come and hear about the book on marriage, but come and encourage some of those couples who are, are still learning this marriage thing. Just your presence there enriches them and blesses them. So come if that's you. And I hope that I'll see you there this weekend. All right, let's pray as we get going. God, I thank you so much for what you have done for us in Jesus Christ. You have made us one. A bunch of different people, different backgrounds brought together in this place. One with your body around the world this morning. What a great blessing. God, you have accomplished that, as Brecian just said, through the death and resurrection of your son, Jesus Christ. In him we have forgiveness that you have washed us clean, that you look at us and you see your son. We praise you, God, for that greatest blessing. As we look at that blessing this morning, as we uncover that treasure, may we be filled with awe. I pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Imagine with me for a second that you had an older brother your older brother really liked cars. And so he got a job when he was 14 or 15 and started saving up for a car. He saved for years for this car that he really wanted. Just this car that he thought was the coolest car. And finally, he's maybe sophomore in college. He's able to buy that car and he comes home over Christmas and he's got this car and he's so proud of it. And you're like, hey, bro, can I drive it? And he says, no way. And so later that night when he's asleep, you go and you grab the keys. And you're just a little pipsqueak at this point, okay? And you go and you grab the keys and you climb into his car and it is nice. And you like the feel of it and you put the keys in and you start it up and it sounds nice. And you decide, I'm just gonna take it for a little spin and you go down the driveway and you go about a block and you run into your neighbor's mailbox. And your brother hears this. He's upstairs, it wakes him up. He comes downstairs and he sees you and he's a nice brother. And so the first thing he says is, are you okay? And you said, yeah, bro, I'm good. And he says, that's good because I'm going to kill you. <laughs> right? Okay. You run as you should. And you call mom and dad while you're on the run and you're like, should I come home? And they're like, no, you should go stay with Uncle Bill because this is the kind of thing Uncle Bill would do. And so you go to Uncle Bill's and let's just say you stay at Uncle Bill's and you don't mean to stay there forever. You just kind of don't want to go home and face your brother and you certainly don't want to help to pay for the damage to the car. And so you're just kind of thinking to yourself, I'm going to just stay away until he takes care of it. 
And then maybe he settles down, but he's just not settling down. He's pretty upset. And so you just stay away and stay away. And days turn to weeks and weeks to months, months to years. And you don't talk to your brother again for years and years. You build your own family. He builds his own family. You're doing your own things. You see him on Facebook. Your wife is friends with his wife. And so you follow what's going on in his life, but um, you don't talk to him. And then you got to come home for something. Something's happened to the parents, or some reunion. You've got to come home and you know you're going to see your brother. Haven't seen him in all these years, 15 plus years maybe. So what do you do? Well, if you're smart, you send him a card, right? Brother, how you doing? We didn't end on good terms. Here's a Chick-fil-A gift card. <laughs> Everybody loves Chick-fil-A. Uh, maybe a Starbucks gift card. You throw something in there, right? You're trying to make it up to him, trying to repay him. You, you send him a couple back, you know, a backlog of your Christmas cards that he's missed. Um, you send him a mixtape of all the songs y'all used to listen to together, right? You're trying to win him over to gain his affection to somehow repay what you took all those years ago and never made up for. That's what you would do if you're smart. And that, let me tell you, is a biblical thing to do. Not the mixtape necessarily, but to make it up to him. You know what Jesus says? Look, look what Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount. If you're offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother or sister has something against you, you should leave your gift there in front of the altar First, go and be reconciled to them. Settle matters quickly with them. That means get even with them. Make it right. Otherwise, you'll be thrown into jail and you'll be there until you've paid the last penny, until you have made it right, he says. And so, in fact, your 15 years of distance of not being reconciled was unbiblical. You should have the first thing, right? First thing. First, you should go and be reconciled to them. You should make it you should make it right. Maybe you saw this story in the news of this house in Watercolor, Florida, 30A area, $8 million mansion down there. The owners were out of town and so some high schoolers broke into it. Did you hear about this? They didn't break into it to steal anything. They broke into it to host that party. 200 teenagers descended on this $8 million mansion and they, they put a boxing ring in the middle of the living room of this mansion. They wore the owner's clothes, they drank the owner's wine, and like the intelligent high schoolers they are, they posted all of it online. Uh, high schoolers, if that felt like a slight, it was. Um, and so the sheriff's department begins to reshare all these photos from these kids because they're trying to identify all the kids in the photos. And so the sheriff said that he gets two kinds of calls from parents after this. One kind of call is from parents who are mad. How dare you post photos of my child online? To which the sheriff said, to be clear, your child posted photos of your child online. But then the second kind of calls were from parents who said, hey, hey, my kid was there and they will pay for anything that they damaged. They'll make it up to him. All right. That gets us ready to look at this story of Jacob and Esau again. We looked at this story last week. We're looking at it from another angle this week, and we're going to redeem our brother Esau just a little bit. Let me set the stage. <clears throat> Jacob steals the birthright and blessing from his older brother Esau. What that means, the birthright and blessing means that as the oldest brother, he gets most of his father's inheritance, at least a double portion of it. And Jacob steals it through some kind of cunning and secrecy and leveraging his brother's need in one desperate moment. Okay, he takes it. And the New Testament, though, looks back on Jacob and Esau, and Jacob's kind of the hero and Esau the villain because Jacob's trying, even through his kind of seedy ways, to secure a lasting inheritance, whereas Esau trades something that lasts for something that's right now and immediate. We talked about that last week. So the New Testament looks at it one way, but I'm going to guess Esau did not look at it that way. Esau has every right to be furious with his brother. In fact, the last thing that he said to his brother or about his brother before his brother ran away to live with the uncle and ended up being gone for 15 plus years, the last thing he said to him, I will kill my brother Jacob. Look at that, Genesis 27, 41. I will kill him. That's the last thing he said. And I think he meant it. 
So it's been 15 plus years. Jacob and Esau have both built their own families, haven't talked to each other in all that time. And Jacob's got to come back home, or at least come to where Esau is now. And he knows he's going to run into him. And we're told he is afraid and distressed. Because that's how they ended. That's how they parted ways. He stole from his brother, and his brother said he was going to kill him. And then he finds out that his brother is marching towards him, and he's marching towards him with 400 men. So that ratchets up the fear. And so this is what he decides to do. He's going to send him some gifts. He sends him uh, 200 female goats. You can read about this in Genesis 32. 20 male goats, 200 ewes, 20 rams, 30 female camels with their young, 40 cows, 10 bulls, 20 female and 10 female donkeys. It is an impressive, I'm sorry. Some of the wives in this room are wearing a necklace for the same reason, right? He's trying to soften her up. Soften him up in this case. So he sends him these gifts. And he says so. He says, for he thought, I will pacify him. Look at this, 3220. I will pacify him with these gifts I'm sending on ahead. And later when I see him, perhaps, maybe, he'll receive me. He'll forgive me because of all these gifts. But come with me, come into Genesis 33. We're going to skip an interlude with Jacob wrestling with the angel of the Lord. That's a great story, but we'll skip it. Come with me to 33 verse 4. What happens is not what Jacob expects. Look at this. But Esau ran to meet Jacob and embraced him. He threw his arms around his neck and kissed him, and they wept. Pause there. If you would, leave that up on the screen. I shared this story last week. This is Luke 15. It's a story Jesus tells about a son who ruins and uh, wastes his inheritance and comes back to his father. Look at how the story ends there. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him, was filled with compassion for him. Look at this. Ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. You see that? Okay. Jesus tells that story to share the gospel with us. Come back here. What kind of story are we looking at right now? This is a gospel story here in Genesis 33. Okay, look at this. Esau ran to meet Jacob, embraced him. He threw his arms around his neck and kissed him, and they wept. And Esau asked, look at this in verse 8. What's the meaning of all these flocks and herds that I met on the way? Well, to find favor in your eyes, my Lord. But Esau said, I already have plenty my brother. Keep what you have for yourself. Okay, look at this. Leave that up there on the screen for one more second, if you don't mind, if you would throw that back up. Jacob's apology, his repentance, which he should have done, should have done a long time ago, which was, which was the right thing to do. Jacob's apology and repentance does not matter to Esau. He doesn't care. That is not why he's forgiving Jacob. Look at it. Why is he forgiving Jacob? Because, brother, I already have plenty. He's forgiving Jacob not because of anything that Jacob has done to earn his forgiveness. He's forgiving Jacob because he's good. I've been blessed. I'm fine. So he can forgive him. In some ways, Jacob's forgiveness has nothing to do with Jacob. I mean, it's to Jacob, it's for Jacob, but he didn't earn it at all. And yet Esau just forgives him. You see that? We have this wonderful ministry here at Highland called Freedom Prayer. And you can sign up to be part of it or to be prayed over by Freedom Prayer anytime on our website. But the way it works is that you go and you meet with a couple people who help you to pray and have an encounter with the Lord. And specifically what we're after is freedom from some kind of burden that you're carrying. As we were taught how to lead people in this kind of prayer, what was really clear to us is that by and large, the burden that most people need freedom from is some wound from someone else. And often that wound is from a family member because nobody can hurt us like family. And so what we do as we pray with you is we bring you to the Father 
is that we ask you to identify that wound. And specifically, what debt did the person who wounded you leave unpaid? You know, kind of a classic example would be maybe you had a father who was distant and cold. Well, what did your father owe you? Your father owed you affection and love. And he did not pay that debt. So the first thing we do is we identify what was the debt that was left unpaid, but then what we do is not what you expect. (laughs) Then what we do is we don't ask you, well, what can you do to get that person to pay that debt they owe you? And then you'll be free. That's not what we do. We say, what was the debt they did not pay they owed you? And has God paid that debt? You didn't get love and compassion from your father, Did you get it from the Heavenly Father? And if so, hasn't that debt been paid? And if it has, then you might can be free. Do you see that? Okay, I'm trying to say two things here at the same time. And the first one, I'm kind of glossing by. The second one's what I'm emphasizing today. But the first one's worth saying. If you wrong somebody, It sure helps them forgive you if you make it right. That's what Jesus says. Number one. Number two, if someone wrongs you, you can still forgive them even if they never make it right. You want me to repeat those? If someone wrongs you, it sure helps if you make it right. Sorry, if you wrong somebody, It sure helps if you make it right. If someone wrongs you, you can forgive them even if they never make it right. And um, let me be clear here. Come back with me to Genesis here, 32. It, It takes Esau a while to get there. He's not immediately ready to forgive his brother. When when I do premarital counseling, we talk about microwaves and crock pots, not crack pots, crock pots. And um, what tends to happen in a marriage is a, is a microwave marries a crock pot. So microwaves are those who want a resolution really quick to the problem. You know, like you have a fight and immediately after they're like, let's be good. Okay. But you, you're a crock pot and you need to simmer on this a while. Okay. Esau's a crock pot. It takes him a while because look what happens immediately after Jacob steals his blessing. This is what he says to his father, Isaac. Do you have only one blessing, my father? Genesis 27, verse 38. Bless me too, my father. But then Esau wept aloud. Esau held a grudge against Jacob because of the blessing. Whereas now, 15 plus years later, come to me with me at Genesis 33, verse 9. He forgives because I already have plenty, my brother. You see the difference there? In the first story, when it first happens, he's living in a world of scarcity. There's not enough blessing to go around. There's not enough stuff to go around. There's not enough goodness from the Lord or from his father to go around. So I've got to keep hold of mine. I've got to get mine. And if somebody takes it from me, I've got to get it from them. He's living in a world of scarcity. And when you're living in a world of scarcity, that makes it impossible to forgive. But now he's living in a different world. He's living in a world of plenty. And when you live in a world of plenty, it is impossible not to forgive. You see that? So Jacob articulates in verse 11 of chapter 33 what Esau is saying. Jacob says it, but this is what Esau means. God has been gracious to me, and I have all I need. This is one of the best one-sentence summaries of the gospel I've ever seen. In Genesis 33. Look at that. If you're a circler in your Bible, an underliner, underline this one. Keep that up there on the screen for just a second. If you're the kind of person that puts scriptures up in your house, over your doorway, put this one up over your doorway. If you get tattoos, I'm not going to tell you to do that, but Brecian would. Look at his arm next week. This will be there, okay? All right. This is it. I don't live in a world of scarcity because of what God has done for me in Jesus Christ. What kind of world do I live in? A world of plenty. God has been gracious to me, and I have all I need. 
Now, if I could live into that, wouldn't that have the power to transform every part of my life? All the conflicts I'm in, all the things I worry and have anxiety about, all the things I want and think I need, if I truly believed that God and Jesus Christ has been gracious to me and I have all I need. I think it would. It makes this forgiveness between Jacob and Esau possible. And it seemed impossible. You see that? Paul says it like this. Again, this is, this is the gospel here. And Paul says, when you're living in the gospel, this is what's possible. He says, get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, brawling, and slander, along with every form of malice. Get rid of all that stuff. You can be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other. Why? Just as in Christ Jesus, God forgave you. You see that? Okay, why do I forgive somebody who wrongs me? Not because they make it right. Because God has given me all I need. Because God has forgiven me when I didn't deserve it. In fact, if you read in Genesis 32, as Isaac, or sorry, as Jacob is coming to meet his brother, he prays to God, and you know what he prays to God? I am unworthy of all the kindness and faithfulness you have shown me. I don't deserve the forgiveness and grace that you have given me, Lord. And yet you have. Yeah, yeah. I want you to do an exercise with me here for the last few minutes here. Close your eyes with me. Some of you, yours are already closed. I, I can see you, just to be clear. Uh, close your eyes for me for a second. I want you to imagine yourself at the foot of of the cross of Jesus Christ. And you're looking up at the Son of God giving Himself that you might be forgiven. And then someone bumps into you in the crowd. You don't turn around and shove them. You don't turn around and say, excuse you. Keep your eyes closed. Like Paul says in Philippians 2, when you're looking at the cross, you're filled with tenderness and compassion. A person bumps into you and it just rolls right off your back. You don't even care, right? I mean, mean, you're looking up at the one on the cross that you might be forgiven. It doesn't matter what somebody else does to you. Okay, stay there. Imagine there at the cross with you is the person that you have not been reconciled with. For some of you, this is painful. I know that. Imagine this person who's hurt you, never paid that debt back. And they're there with you at the foot of the cross. Can you still hold on to that right there? Is it even possible? And if you're still holding on to it, look up. Look at this one. Giving himself that you might be forgiven. Can you even hold on to your anger anymore? God has been gracious to you. And you have all you need. Open your eyes for me. Jesus tells a story about this, about a a servant and a king. And the servant owes the king 10,000 bags of gold. It's more than he could earn in 20 lifetimes. And the king calls him in. He says, it's time for you to pay the debt. And he says, I can't pay it. And he says, okay, I'll forgive you. And the servant can't believe this. He feels so much lighter. He feels free. He's been forgiven by the king. And he walks out and there's a guy down the road who owes him a hundred bucks. And he says, you better pay me right now. You owe me. And the guy can't pay him. So he prepares to bring the whole weight of the law down on this guy who can't pay him a hundred bucks. And the king finds out about it. And he brings the servant back in. And he says this to him. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant? Just as I had mercy on you. 
Not shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant because he paid back the debt? He doesn't even say anything about the fellow servant. Except shouldn't you have had mercy on him because I had mercy on you? Hmm. I'll end with this story. Genesis ends on this note, actually. Joseph, Jacob, one of Jacob's sons, is badly wronged by his brothers. That's a long story, but terribly wronged by them. And years later, though, they come back together and Jacob forgives his brothers. He welcomes them into the place of safety where he is in Egypt. He, he blesses them, he feeds them. But his father, Jacob, is still alive. And then when Jacob dies, Joseph's brothers are convinced that he's not going to keep forgiving them. He's going to exact his vengeance now because dad's not here to intervene anymore. And so they lie and they tell him, hey, um, you slipped out of the room for a second when dad was on his deathbed, but he, he told us to make sure that you knew that you needed to forgive us. It's not true. Not true. But Joseph says in response, oh, don't be afraid. Am I in the place of God? You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done to save the saving of many lives. So, so then don't be afraid. I'll provide for you and your children. And he reassured him and spoke kindly to them. It's that, it's that short line, am I in the place of God? What's he saying? There's only one who has a right to hold a grudge. And even he doesn't do it. How can I? God has been gracious to me, and I have all I need. Amen? Let me pray over you. God, I know that there are some in here this morning for whom this topic is very tender. It touches deep places, wounds, hurts, burdens. God, I pray that through your son, Jesus, they might be free. They might see and experience and know that by his death, they have been forgiven. They have been freed. The debts owed to them have been paid. Would you free them then, allow them to forgive? God, you have given to us this ministry of reconciliation. May it be true in our own lives first. I pray this in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen.